Ladies and gentlemen, Norman Lamb. Well, very good to see you all here this evening. Uh, thanks for turning up. And can I also thank all of the people who stood as candidates uh, in the general election in this region? Because it was a tough gig, this uh, general election, uh, and it required some fortitude. And the party required people to step up to the plate and be candidates. And we're enormously grateful to all of you and to the teams who supported those candidates across this region. So thank you very much indeed. Can I also just check how many new members uh, are there here this evening? Can you just put up your hands quickly? Look at that. Just I think that's about the biggest percentage that I've seen in any of the hustings. So all of you who've joined, all of you who've decided to join the cause, uh, those of us who've been around for a while uh, are enormously grateful. It's reinvigorated us, it really has. And I think everyone now feels uh, up for the fight to rebuild the Liberal voice in our country. Now the next thing I wanted to say is this is an election which I can confidently predict will be won by a Liberal Democrat. <laughs> uh, which I think comes as quite a relief for all of us. Um, but it will be the first of very many, won't it? Yeah. Yes, come on! <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and I should incidentally mention to you that last Thursday in Richmond, in the London Borough of Richmond, the Lib Dems gained uh, a very safe Tory seat. And it was a candidate, a new member, so all you new members, just watch it. Because uh, she was literally asked on the final day before uh, the selection was made, and she agreed, she was on a bus to a meeting, and she had to get off the bus and go to the selection meeting. She was selected as the candidate and she won the seat for the Conservatives, so she deserves a round of applause as well. <laughs> So it's very good to be back in this region. I am a Leicester graduate, uh, quite a while ago, uh, but I am a Leicester graduate. I uh, graduated in law at Leicester University, le leaving in 1980. Um, and, uh, and this region, I think, actually has enormous promise. You've got uh, councils, Opie and Wigston, who, who do the most amazing work. Uh, Hinkley, which has been brilliant in the work that it's done. Sadly, as I understand it, losing control in May. But again, thank you to all those councillors who have uh, kept the flame burning. Um, before you make your decision, those of you who haven't yet decided, uh, you will need to know something about my values, what, I, uh, what drives me, uh, my purpose. You'll want, I think, to know something about my ambition for the party. And I think you also need to know what steps I think we need to take to realise that ambition. So let me first of all tell you a bit about myself. I've always tried throughout my adult life to live, live out my liberal values. Uh, and long before I was elected to Parliament, working as a lawyer, uh, I took on the MOD. And uh, the situation was that 5,500 women had been discharged from the armed forces for getting pregnant. Uh, it was an unlawful act, uh, that, that, that was the dismissal, not the act of getting pregnant. Uh, and, uh, and we took on the MOD, it was unlawful under the Equal Treatment Directive, and we won compensation for those women, many of whom had glittering careers, uh, brought to an outrageous end because of the act of the Ministry of Defence. The, the Daily Mail hated it, but I regard that as a badge of honour. Uh, it's something... It's something, surely, that every Liberal Democrat must aspire to, to be hated by the Daily Mail. Uh, so I was then elected to Parliament in 2001, and in my first term, it was the period of the Iraq War, and I wanted to know who Tony Blair had been meeting in the run-up to the Iraq War, who had been influencing him, and there were some very wealthy Iraqi business people uh, who had an interest, we thought, in the overthrow of the regime, which it was claimed in The Guardian might have been meeting him. So I asked the question, who have you met over the last year? And the answer came back, I don't answer that question. So I challenged Blair under free, freedom of information and we won a, uh, a groundbreaking victory to establish the principle that every citizen of our country, all of us, have the right to know who our Prime Minister and our Ministers meet with 
who are influencing them in the decisions that they reach. Mind you, when I became a minister and I was told I had to complete details of every meeting I attended, I thought, oh my goodness, I'm responsible for that. Uh, but you have to live by the standards you set. Uh, and then I took on BAE Systems. BAE Systems had sold a military air traffic control system to Tanzania, one of the poorest countries in the world. And it was an outrageous deal. It was a corrupt deal. Uh, and I collaborated with Claire Short, the development secretary at the time, who was challenging Tony Blair on the grant of an export license for this deal. Blair granted that license, but we exposed uh, an outrageous deal. It ended up with the Serious Fraud Office prosecuting BAE Systems, uh, and compensation was secured for Tanzania. But we have to always uh, fight to uh, expose wrongdoing of that sort and to uphold liberal values, which don't understand party uh, boundary. Uh, uh, country boundaries. They are universal values. So we fight for them in the developing world as well as at home. And then, I suppose perhaps most of all, in my work uh, as a campaigning minister in mental health, I was fighting for the principle, the really important principle in my view, uh, that people who suffer from mental ill health should have the same right to access treatment as anyone else. Uh, and that's not the case. Uh, there's a massive discrimination at the heart of our NHS. How can it possibly be right that someone who suffers from suspected cancer has a right to a consultation with a specialist within two weeks of referral? But if you're a teenager who suffers the first episode of psychosis, which can have a massive impact on your whole life, can lead to a life on benefits, a life with difficult relationships, you have no such right. You can't begin to justify it because we know that early intervention can literally rescue that person, can give them the chance of a good life. And so I'm really proud of the fact that as Liberal Democrats, we secured the first ever maximum waiting time standards in mental health from April of, of this year, particularly for youngsters who suffer a first episode of psychosis. And you have to be prepared to fight for these things. There was a moment as I was building up my case to implement these standards when I was told we may, we may not be able to do this. We may, ha may just have to be a manifesto commitment uh, for the next parliament. And I said, if that is the case, I'm resigning. I'm not prepared to allow that to happen. This is too important. Uh, and because I made a stand, it happened. But sometimes you have to stand up and be counted. And wherever I went in my work as Minister for Mental Health, I saw so many people who were let down by the system, treated as second-class citizens, including those with learning disability, families who felt completely ignored by the system. And as a Liberal, I can't tolerate that. Every person should be treated with dignity, should be treated equally. No second-class citizens at all. Uh, and we established, we proposed new rights for people to challenge decisions that are made on their behalf, to, ch to have some control over the money that's available for their, for their care. And I will hold the Conservatives to account to implement those rights that we proposed just short of the general election. And this idea, this principle of powerful citizens all treated equally, is at the heart of why we will fight to defend the Human Rights Act against assault from this Conservative government. Thank you. But along with the principle of powerful citizens, there is also the fact that we must always celebrate diversity. We must always fight for the principle that every individual should be able to be who they are to live their life as they want to lead it, as long as they're not harming others. No conformity enable people to be themselves, to lead a happy life. This is at the heart of our liberalism. And we must always be intolerant of injustice, of entrenched poverty and of discrimination, and we must seek to combat it wherever we see it. And then there is the really important principle that every child in our country has the same right to make the most of their talents, to flourish as individuals. And it's a sad reflection of our society that there are still so many children 
whose futures are determined by the circumstances of their birth. And that's why our implementation of the pupil premium, which this year will give two and a half billion pounds to children from the poorest backgrounds. It's m literally making a difference to individual children's lives. And it's because of the Liberal Democrats in government that that's happening. And now the Tories are threatening to undermine it or to abolish it altogether. That would be a disgrace. And again, we must fight to defend it. And then finally, in terms of the values that we hold, and I don't think we always talk about this enough, but for me, along with freedom comes responsibility. We have responsibility to one another in our communities. We believe in strong communities, mutual support. We have a responsibility for the proper stewardship of our planet. And we have a responsibility to work internationally to bring people together, not to divide them. These are the principles that drive me in everything that I do and I expect are shared by everyone together in this room. So let me say something about my ambition for this party. I want us to think big. The world has changed completely. Change happens remarkably fast. So in politics, you see a rapid rise of the SNP because they connected with people. You see UKIP connecting with people and rising very rapidly. It may be a message that we totally disagree with, but they did connect with people. Look at the world of commerce where you have big household names, here one day, gone the next, and new startups that appear and suddenly catch fire because there's a ready market out there for their product or their service. And I want to see us as a dynamic new startup with a massive potential market because in many ways this is a liberal age. There are so many people out there who share our values, the values that I've been talking about, but don't necessarily associate themselves with this party. And our task, in a nutshell, is to connect with those people, to speak to our values. And if we can do that, I really believe we can build a dynamic, progressive, radical, liberal movement of change. And we must aspire to be in government because you only make a difference to people's lives if you grab power and give power away to people. That must be our purpose. There is no point in everything we do unless we seek to make a difference to people's lives in our communities, in our councils, and in Parliament. So let me tell you the steps that I think we need to take. The first step, I think we need root and branch reform of the way that our party operates. I don't think we always li live out our liberal values in the way in which our party behaves. It's far too complex. I don't begin to understand all of the committees. Thank you. You share my view. I don't understand the structure of our party, all of the committees, how people get elected to them. And if it's confusing, you don't have clear accountability. We pride ourselves on our internal democracy but it depends on you being able to get to a party conference. In this electronic age, why can't we link everyone up to our conference so that everyone can observe debates and then vote, vote in those... <laughs> vote on policy uh, decisions at our conference. Everyone can participate, including all those new members who put up their hands a moment ago. And I want a programme of engagement for all new members and others so that they can understand about what our, what our purpose is, get down to Parliament, see uh, what Parliament is like, learn what's going on in some of our successful councils around the country. If we engage people, then they will feel part of it and they are more likely to stay. And do we really need a, a really expensive headquarters in the most expensive part of London? Should we not at this moment, when the way in which we use our money will become of prime importance, should we not be spending our money where it really counts, campaigning on the ground? <laughs> so let me now move on to the second uh, step that I think we need to take. We want need to once again become a really effective election winning machine. We've fallen behind the curve. In the 90s we used to be feared but other parties have overtaken us. We need to get back based on the principle of community politics, campaigning to give power to people, giving people a reason to vote for us, giving power to communities 
and to people. And in that way, again, we can start to become successful again. The third step I think we need to take, and it is essential, I want us to become an intellectual powerhouse. You think back to the 60s, those of you who are old enough, uh, Joe Grimmond, that really radical liberal, he got something moving. He got the big thinkers from outside the party to think big about liberal solutions for the big challenges of that decade. He excited a new generation of young people. 2,000 people used to attend young liberal conferences in the 60s, and they became the activists and the councillors, and indeed some of them uh, MPs in due course. We need to do the same again. And let me say this to you, we will not win by just more campaigning. We campaigned ourselves into the ground in May, and by and large we didn't win. It has to be a combination of effective campaigning and critically winning the battle of ideas. And then finally, we need to inspire that new generation of young people to our cause. Young people are overwhelmingly liberal in their instincts, their values, their attitudes. They're open, they're dynamic, they're internationalist in their attitudes. They believe in opportunity. These are liberal values. They believe in radical reform of our outrageous antiquated drug laws, which criminalise so many young people and put billions of pounds into the hands of uh, criminal networks around our country. So these are the things that we need to do to connect with young people and to inspire that new generation of young people to rally to our cause. Let me end by saying this to you. I was talking recently to a young woman who's a Liberal Youth member and I was talking to her about the work I've done on mental health. And she said to me, and it meant a lot to me, you've restored my faith in politics. And given that my whole purpose is to try to make a difference to people's lives, that was an important thing that she said to me. But I believe that we can all, as a party, restore people's faith in politics by doing politics differently, by telling it straight, by speaking again from the heart, by speaking to our values. And if we do that, I really believe that we can build a radical, progressive, liberal movement of change. And we must be audacious. We must be ambitious. We must aspire to be in government. So if you share my ambition for this party, do consider supporting me in this election. Thank you very much indeed.